Thank you to Jan for uh, setting the scene. Yes. <laughs> so regulation, uh, as he said, a rather a boring uh, thing, but I should say that. <laughs> it's, well, I would say it's like watching grass grow. Uh, and but it's it, it, it requires a certain type of expert to really get involved. Uh, but I will tell you, as a researcher, you learn so much about the technology that you're working with when you know you have to look at it from this side, this side, this side, this side. As researchers, when we make a research prototype, it's like a piece of paper. But when you start doing what kind of uh, Jan talked about, it really requires an uh, incredible insight. So I'll, I'll try to give you a, just a little bit more insight that uh, I've been, I am a trustee of a, a charity, Power. Some of you may have heard of Plower, Climbing and Walking Robots. This was set up in 1998, and in 2012, it became a UK charity. As a trustee of this charity, uh, its mission is to actually advance robotics for the public benefit. Now, in 2002, we, we, like trustees, we are sort of, we were doing a lot of research like you are, and then some of our partners were trying to commercialize, and they were failing miserably, as they are doing even now. And at that time, uh, maybe a small improvement, so, but, but really, it, it is a long struggle. The, and the main reason is that in, in, in robotics was really meant to be only industrial robots. The kind of things which are used for making cars and so on. And then people started making mobile robots, making robots to, uh, to provide services. Services then became medical services and so on. So you can understand, but when people started looking at these industrial robots, mobile robots, and then started to commercialize them, the regulations didn't allow human robot interaction because robots was just too dangerous. So this is why we started as Cloud, we started looking at interacting with ISO. And uh, since 2002, and you as you'll see that Clower has been leading much of this work and, and how, how, how it's, it's been going. But having said that, let me sort of talk about modularity because modularity comes after safety and so on. Uh, so, but, but the safety has, has, has got to be looked at. So my take on this is, of course, I, I am a, an academic like most of you. Uh, uh, so I'm Dean of a School of Engineering in, in a university called UPS. The university is right there. At the top, if you all see the Triangle of, of India, just below the Himalayas, so it's absolutely a beautiful part of the world, uh, and uh, untouched. And nature is just, just, just really very much like, like here. In fact, <laughs> I, I'm very pleased to come to San Sebastian and so on. And uh, the reason, uh, uh, and uh, I have this uh, company in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, so my base is, is in UK as well. Uh, but I went to India to commercialize. Uh, exoskeletons, which I've been working for the last 12 years. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So, I, so this man, uh, this Endo Energy Systems is the exoskeleton company, which is as a base in UK in Cambridge and in uh, SDPI Mohali, which is a little bit left in Punjab uh, and, and in UPS. So which one? Is the top one? On the side. side. Thank you. So here's my stuff. So I'll give you, but I'll try to be very fast. And I'll try to focus on the things. So I was interested in the introduction to your project. So I'll try to make it more relevant to, to that. Uh, okay. So, so this is a history of robotics. How, how it's been changing, you know, from the... Uh, so I, I've missed out the industrial robots because that's, for me, rather boring. So I, I was never interested in manipulators and things like that. But we, uh, when I first became into robots, I was working in robots for hazardous environments, to going to nuclear reactors, going to, uh, uh, we did some work with uh, in the North Sea, looking at offshore wind farms and so on, going to inspect them. And then oil tanks, to how you make a robot going to an explosive environment. So these are all incredible things, believe it or not. Uh, and having got that kind of technology, people started doing what I just said here, service robot, but you couldn't do it. And even now industrial robots 
people are starting to do things like this. They want to get humans inside the work cell, and how to do that is proving to be quite a challenge. Imagine a robot that can lift half a metric ton, whizzing around, and little old you or me are in there. I wouldn't like to be there. It's <laughs> really, really dangerous. So people are trying to do that. And so, uh, so this thing we talk about safety. So, so these kind of uh, so-called service robots. They started off being called personal care robots, uh, uh, and the personal care is a. As you will see, that definitions are so important in in standardization, because it's not what. So you're what we understand is what the world understands by that term. So you've got to really define it in a way that the world would understand that term. And so one of the most important things was you have to define what is a robot. And believe it or not, that took about five years. Believe it or not, five years. And it's still changing. Uh, and then different types of robots have different definitions. And here then modularity. Okay, because to make the robots, you need components, right? And then to make damn good robots, you need modules. The difference is about interoperability, how they connect together, how easily they connect together or not, as the case may be. Okay, uh, so Jan has already kind of uh, given you an idea, but this is a bit more resolution on the ISO side of the, the world. So TC299, it grew out of 184. And, and these are currently the, the working groups. And here you missed working group nine, which is actually, I'm still convener of that. So this looks at, it's a collateral standard. And the collateral standard is looking at medical electrical equipment, not, which includes robots, but so it's not a, a particular, but it's, it's looking at robotic technology. So how you put robotic technology into medical equipment. OK, and the, the one of the main things about that is uh, when ISO and IEC started looking at robotics in medical applications, the, the only difference the whole world said was a robot has autonomy. OK, so if you want to put robotic technology to medical electrical equipment, being a medical robot, you are putting autonomy into there. And if you put autonomy into a medical device, you're putting extra risk. Right? No, it's true. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, the world believes it's a risk. It decides it wants to do something. And the world does not yet believe us that we are ready to able to produce a medical device that will make decisions. OK, so, uh, so for example, for nearly seven, eight, nine years, I've been telling researchers like me, nobody wants a self-learning medical device. OK, because nobody can say it. Because to certify it, you've heard Jan give you this incredible route, and you put on this switch, switch this button on, so you certify it, done the clinical testing and so on. You then press the self learn button. The thing changes. Certification is lost. You have to redo it. OK, so, so as researchers, we have to understand as academics, this is a great area of research, but you're not going to be able to sell it. it nobody would, it's like the driverless cars now. You see the whole the problems uh, with, with that. So the, the yellow things. And in fact, the, the ones that I was uh, a convener of, so you can see this is all clients and several of my, are, are my colleagues and so one, two, three, four. So five groups I was actually convener of. So I have this deep, intimate knowledge of robotic safety, working with international experts, uh, both from a machine perspective and from a medical perspective, because the processes are quite different. And using that knowledge is what I'm planning, you know, with my company, and I'll say a, a few things about that. 
Okay, so modularity. So this is this slide is about 15 to 20 years old. Okay, just to tell you, because modularity is not a new thing. It's actually even older. So essentially, what you're talking about is here. You've got this uh, a Kamau. I think it's a Kamau robot, uh, uh, industrial robot. And if you, you know, you can plug wheels on it, you can plug different manipulators on it, different controllers on it. And, 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 and if you can do it well enough, it seems to be having good modularity. If you can't do it easily, it seems to have bad modularity. And of course, as uh, good modules, we want to uh, have good modularity. So this is a, a typical supply chain. Probably Okoma has something like this. So CS are component suppliers. So basically, uh, uh, Cooper, Intuitive, Surgical, or Toyota, or, or, or some general automotive, which is my attempt at making it a little bit wider, is that you create your supply chain and you lock your component supplier to you. Uh, and so, oops. So people, uh, 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 have great difficulty to go, for example, from the Kuka supply chain to the intuitive supply chain. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, when I was working, uh, uh, we, were, uh, we had a company in the UK as well. We were selling uh, airbags to the automotive sector. You all know airbags, right? Just in the middle of you know, Save you going smack in the windscreen. Uh, we were selling them to Toyota, sorry, I believe give names away. And, and because this is, happens a lot. So we were a small company, we were making airbags, and uh, Toyota gave us this contract when we had this great contract for us. And every year they say, make it better and make it cheaper. Right? Second year, we did it. We got another year. Third year, same thing. Make it cheaper, make it better. And of course, you can understand what's happening. You know, as a small company, you're tied into this thing, and uh, we would try. And then the third year, they actually went somewhere else, and my company went bust. Okay, and this is what actually happens to supply chains like this. So this taught me the <laughs> where the power lies in a supply chain chain like this. So forget about how many papers you're publishing. You know, if you want to make a, a, a company, you better make sure that if you're making a component, that component is actually transferable. To, and this is when we decided, I decided with my colleagues, that modularity was actually quite important. And we needed to move away from this so-called closed modularity to open modularity. So that's... Uh, and, and also, so this is you can. So we just published a paper on, on that. So if you're, if you're interested, you can sort of download that. But one of the most interesting things in European projects like this, and in ISO meetings, is these things, right? We can't even connect our damn computers to the mains. We need these, uh, trans, you know, these different adapters everywhere. You cannot imagine the, the photographs that, that we've had in situation because companies are not interested because it's it's actually giving away their some somehow they, they feel they're weakening and they, they do not want to change. So all of these methods work, of course. If somebody with some real power said, right, we just choose that one, that'll be good. We can go anywhere in this planet and plug our thing in. But will it happen? Not a Captain Nelson. Okay. And this is the problem. And, and, and the latest thing, remember with the mobile phones? A few years ago, you threw the mobile phone away, you have to throw the adapter away. Because the connector will all this. The European EC made a, a ruling based on it was actually on the environment. Because there was so much wasted. They said you have to use a common adapter, a, a socket. And then what happened? Manufacturers stopped giving you a child. This is what happens. But at least now we have a type C, you know, 
that can fix most of our problems. This is this is a sort of commercial and uh, uh, sort of practical and uh, for the benefit of, of society. Okay, so why modularity standardization? Because we are uh, reinventing the wheel again and again and again and again and again. It just doesn't make sense. And and and, and ISO is or IEC, they have the international clout that if you make an ISO standard, it will have some weight. It's not like Okoma making a standard because of course Okoma will adopt it, but nobody else will. My company might make a standard, nobody else will be interested in it. Researchers have published a lot of paper on modularity, but nobody else is interested in them. Okay, so we have to have an ISO standard. And this is why we suggested this, that we should make a, an ISO standard. And this uh, group, uh, W Working Group 6, was set up in uh, 2014, and uh, it was actually led by the Chinese. Were you there at that meeting? Were you there at that meeting? Well, where, because for any kind of project like this, it has to be voted upon. And Jan mentioned uh, the uh, consensus. Now, consensus also has to be defined. So there's a simple majority, which we all understand, but consensus in the ISO sense really is 75% of people in a room have to agree. Okay, so there's four of you, three of you agree, and the third, fourth one doesn't, you've got consensus. Okay, so you can extrapolate that. And what was happening uh, at the, when, when this uh, 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 group was uh, uh, suggested, uh, USA didn't want it, Germany didn't want it, Japan didn't want it. All, all the countries which had a lot of robotics were actually against this thing. Do you know why? Any ideas? There power go down because their modules would be replaced by small companies making modules which are better for them better. Okay, so they already have their modularity. They didn't want somebody else in modular. So for like two hours, we, we were hearing the Americans, ah, we don't need this. And the Germans, ah, we don't need this. I'm, I'm a political. This is absolutely how it happens. And Japanese also, we don't want this. Uh, and the Chinese guy stood up and he made a simple statement. Either this thing will be an ISO standard or it will be a Chinese standard. This is 2014. Now the, where the politics is now in Russia and so on. And now everybody's against China and so on. But this was 2014, and really it was at that time most of the world was manufacturing in China. So they were being forced to adopt the Chinese standard. And so as researchers, we of course don't like to get involved in projects and so on, but we are part of it. And, and, and we have to be aware of what we're doing, how it contributes to things or does it. And so, uh, and China then sort of Obviously, I'm a friend of the Chinese, so they invited me to be the Kabina. Uh, but I have no uh, uh, axe to grind against. I fundamentally believe modularity is a great thing, especially open modularity. And, uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work and this uh, uh, ISO 22166-1, which was finally published last year. Uh, uh, it's a lot of detail. I'm not going to go into the detail, but you will definitely you can have the, the PowerPoint. And of course, you can buy the standard. And it tells you all the, the key things all about, uh, uh, about what the world uh, thinks and how they suggest robot modularity should be developed in this open way from both hardware and from a software perspective. So, uh, okay, it's, it's meant to be for uh, uh, framework developers, it's meant to be for designers, it's meant to be for manufacturers, and also for robot integrators. 
Okay, so these the standards written for these people in mind. People are going to build robots itself. So the, the key, so, so this is two key definitions. The difference between a component and a difference between a module. Okay. Uh, and it took a long time, and you can see how many notes there are uh, against each of these, these, these key things. So component is just a small bit of something bigger, okay, with nothing else. A module is actually a component with some special things. And the special things are how it talks to the outside world, how it thinks, and so on, and those interoperability things that we... So, uh, and, and that, of course, is the... the uh, to, to facilitate things like uh, system design, uh, facilitate system integration, interoperability, and reuse, and a few other things. Okay, so there are things like basic modules, uh, like the, 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 the smallest module, and then how you make bigger modules is called a composite module, and then how you so hardware modules and software modules. So all these things have to be defined. You think that it's easy, but I tell you, it's a nightmare to define these things. Absolute nightmare. Somebody has to do it, and once it's done, it's done. Definitions are absolutely so. All these are definitions, words which you all have seen and read, but the world, the robotics world, agrees with these definitions because this has been validated, and now has been the standard has been published. So composability, integrate. So these are the the nine principles of modularity as formulated by working group six and has been accepted. So these are all things which are meant to be part of module. So you've got to be able to compose, you've got to be integrating them, and they all have some very subtle differences. And time doesn't allow me to, uh, to go. And how modules interoperate. So this diagram has been created. So modules, an actuator, a power modulus, uh, uh, a sensor module, a computer uh, module. It links up with other modules through these six interfacing things. So through the environment, uh, uh, mechanically, through some functionality, some communication, power, and safety and security, as we said. So, so, so if, if you're dealing with a safety application, you better have a safety bus in, in your system, in your module. And so, so, so this is, is, uh, is, is called the line diagram, and uh, and some people prefer the circle diagram, but it's exactly the same. Okay, so the the, the thing is radial here, yeah. and so these diagrams are supposed to help you design uh, your, your your robot uh, using um, uh, how the modules will connect with each other. And then there's a template how you actually define the uh, the, the interfaces. So, so this template is meant to uh, be used by module manufacturers, designers, to give you all the way, uh, well, again, time doesn't allow me to, but you can imagine, so you've actually got a, uh, uh, so the person making a module has to give full details about the module so that other people can uh, use the module in the way as, as intended. And so the, uh, the intention is that from the uh, closed supply chain, you go to, open supply chain. And this is the, the model that, that is accepted. So the comp component suppliers have, have ability to go into uh, different sectors uh, in a more uh, uh, more flexible manner. And, and so the, the power uh, in terms of the commercialization is more balanced between the, the people who make the parts versus the people who make the systems. Okay. So, and and, and I'll, I'll tell you, in most countries, 80% of the companies are small to medium sized companies. 80%. Okay? So, for, from a political, governmental, they want to encourage small and medium sized enterprises to have more power. Modularity gives them that more power. But, point is, they don't have king at the end of their supply chain. There's a downside. Okay? Because you've got this nebulous thing for the domestic robot market, right? Here, you know, they've got Tacoma. So if they're making a part, Tacoma buys it. But now, who's going to buy it? So there is a downside. 
uh, until a few things. So, so, so uh, small companies are a little bit frightened of, of that. Now, having published the part one, which is the base standard, well, in the 601 uh, family that Jan described, uh, WGC 6 is uh, making a family of modularity standards. Okay, so there's uh, the level two, the level three, so which are looking at, at uh, common aspects. Then um, the level three are common modules. And uh, the level four are to look at uh, different uh, robot sectors. And I'll just say a little bit about the 402 standard because both Jan and uh, Thierry have been helping us work on that. So it's, it's working, looking at exoskeletons, uh, which is relevant to what you're talking about. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. And, and because of my interest uh, on the commercial, I, I agreed to read that. And well, there's a level five also being worked at, which will be in partnership with IC as well, which is looking at how major, uh, medical modularity can also be facilitated. So that is also, also happening. Now, this is a very important slide. Uh, which uh, some of you may have seen already. So where uh, I think this group is very much focused on this right side of the of the but exoskeleton can be used in a whole variety of ways from making superhumans to making strong cons uh, consumers, uh, elderly, which is what endo energy is focusing on, and then patients. So I split the the, the people who are going to buy this to customers and patients. And it's very important for you to also have this distinction. Uh, uh, now, end, uh, so Endo Energy, because so we have the machinery regulations. Uh, Jan gave you a lot more uh, uh, definition. Uh, there's a, so I, I just focus on the two, the safety standards, which are the 13482, uh, which is dealing with the um, uh, machine exoskeleton. They call physical assistant uh, robots. And then the uh, Rakka robots, which are the 278 that Jan described. Now, what is uh, interesting uh, is that uh, when, uh, so for Endo Energy, we are looking at the elderly, elderly people. Now, during the course of our uh, uh, discussion, the working group, the medical, we as engineers, we all were convinced that these systems were medical devices. They're going to be medical devices for elderly. But the doctors, medical doctors said, getting old is not a disease. Hear those words, getting old is not a disease. So why the hell should we only make medical exoskeletons for elderly people? Listen, right? So of course, getting old has a lot of medical conditions associated with aging. Now it's, and so you, so I, so as we age, our muscle doesn't suddenly, I don't wake up tomorrow morning and I'm physically incapable of moving, but hope not unless you have a major trauma, of course. <laughs> the, the, the point is, so there are non-medical applications for elderly people and there are medical applications. Now, I heard uh, the coordinator say, uh, talk about the, the rehabilitation side of things. And, and, and I know the definition of patients and so on, a medical device and so on. I think you have a uh, legitimate reason that as uh, the person with stroke or has been rehabilitated with the former like device and nothing more can be done, you allow the person to go home. And in some cases, I suspect that patient can become a customer. Okay. So remember that the so regulations allow that. And I think you should consider that possibility because making a consumer exoskeleton would be like a tenth of the price of a medical exoskeleton. So the kind of robots uh, medical that form are made, very expensive. 50,000 net cheapest, right? 50,000, 60,000, yeah, imagine now you're a, you're a consumer. What can you pay? You probably want to pay no more than 5,000, I would imagine, maybe 4,000, maximum, right? So how to make technology, which will be a consumer product that 
you will buy for your grandparents or for yourself or myself in a few years. It, it, and and it's, 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 it's that kind of, it is, it is what we can do for them. And so, so, so this slide, I, as I believe, so endo energy is in this space. And not only that, but this device can be used in this space by medical professionals. Okay, a non medical exercise can be used in a medical with the risk benefit that Jan has mentioned can be done. So the patient can't do it himself or herself, but go to a clinic and they can use my non medical exoskeleton in the clinic. Because of the person, this, remember the doctor always says, This thing can kill you, or I can save you, sign the evidence. So they will do that and they will do that. Because uh, I will give you an example. Have you all seen the Microsoft Wii system? Where you have, you have these uh, two things with the IMUs in there, and you're playing a game. Nintendo. There's a Wii before that. Wii before that. Microsoft? Was it Nintendo? Oh, no, you're right. Nintendo. Nintendo. Yeah, Nintendo. Yeah, Microsoft. Yeah. So this was a game playing, right? So it's a consumer product. Many therapy clinics are using this fee for a patient. Exactly the same thing. All right. So, so they take the liability from the company because they, they see the patient there. And so, so we're hoping that our exoskeleton will also be used by medical companies. And the, the thing is, the machinery regulations, we can self certify. I will self certify my system because I know. But of course, I have to take the file and all those things. Uh, and then we will let medical people use it also. Okay, and this is uh, very important for you as a group also to think that is this uh, interesting for you because uh, the TRL could be a little bit different and a little bit more achievable, maybe. Okay, so now uh, the 402 project, uh, which is right now, Thierry uh, uh, and uh, Jan have joined it. We, we're on a working draft. Uh, and we expect this thing to be uh, launched uh, uh, this time, uh, sorry, this year at, at some point. So where we've kind of given more detail, exactly as he described for the lateral and the, the particular. So it's, it's, uh, it's giving more detail because what we're looking at here is, here we're looking at the human body. So all the modules have to fit the human body, so the modules, yeah? So, so we have to look at uh, the, uh, 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 how the human body can uh, change in different, and there are standards, ISO standards, which actually give the statistics of human sizes in all the different countries. They can go from eight foot, you know, and also weight, and, and all the measurements are statistically, you know, I think, I think 7250, ISO 7250, if you, you want to look at it, it gives you the, uh, the statistics of uh, population in different parts of the world, and so you can then uh, use that to uh, define and uh, make your. So again, we've, we've done the, the same thing, but now the definitions are and everything to do with exoskeleton modules. And we've obviously tried to look at joints. Uh, time also again prevents me, but you see a basic exoskeleton, a composite, uh, it can be uh, like a, 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 a whole arm. A basic could be a, just a knee joint or a hip joint or something like that. Then uh, again, I don't have time to go, but you can see we've got we, we passive. So, I mean, uh, so these are these are actually some companies who are developing uh, passive exoskeleton, semi uh, passive, semi active, and, and active uh, exoskeleton. So these are all have, have to define, be defined in a very very formal way. Uh, and so, if you are working in any of these kind of areas, then please uh, try to maybe join through Terry or or Yan, uh, and please do not. Reinvent the wheel again, okay? Because uh, this is a uh, uh, what else? Okay, so we're looking at uh, a lot of guidelines, okay? And we've uh, the nine principles of uh, so we have uh, tried to uh, the, the nine that I gave you in the part one, we started looking at that from flexor skeletons. So here, uh, the composability is things like okay, so the human body is important, you've got to conform to the human biomechanics. And, and things like that, and and also how the control functionality should be achieved, uh, uh, and, and so on. So granularity, uh, very important. How small should your module be? 
how fine granularity we should go. So these are all uh, very important things in terms of, of, of modularity. Uh, safety and safety has always been there. Now security, as Jan has mentioned, has become very important as well. Uh, so especially if you allow your medical device to be uh, uh, web enabled or uh, internet of uh, things type enabled, because if anybody can tamper, uh, hack it, and get into your system, you can imagine. So so it's very and so there, there, there is actually a, a middle layer being uh, introduced. So safety related security okay so if somebody can hack in and then make the thing unsafe it has a higher priority so safety safety related security and then security so so those two and so a new type of risk assessment have to be introduced for that safety related uh, security we've seen all seen the star wars things haven't you they go into this little chamber and they say, oh, it's a very low level system with going through there. Yeah, you've seen that? Happens, <laughs> happens, happens. So you, you've got to be really careful that uh, any kind of hacking uh, is, is, is at the right level for all the, the systems. Okay, hardware, I, I okay. What I, so I, I think this is almost my, my last slide. So here, what we're talking about is, a, a, a single module, exoskeleton module, can in fact be a system in itself. So you could make a single joint exoskeleton, okay, say for the knee, that is a system in itself. So because the kind of things it's looking at, uh, sensors, uh, control, and, and I won't bore you with the details, but, but and then if you then connect the joints, you are getting joint one, joint two. So then it becomes a system exactly the same way, like a medical electrical equipment and medical electrical system. So the same thing can happen with uh, exoskeleton. So you can make a module for a joint and then it connects up to make a leg, and so on. And so we have to define uh, the software architecture that would facilitate that kind of a, uh, that kind of a, uh, uh, functionality. Okay, uh, I, I hope, uh, I, I've tried to cover a lot of things, but I hope it was interesting, but uh, still uh, you guys, I believe are trying to develop a uh, low TRL, what Thierry said, but I, I urge you to find shortcuts to get the TRL a little bit higher, uh, if you can. And I hope what I've sort of told you is don't think that what you're doing is only medical. There are non-medical things, and they may be easier for you to achieve. And the regulations allow it. So thank you for your, your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, sir. Thank you, Gurvinder. So this was also a very good, uh, and I think it's for us really motivating when you tell us go out of medical. I mean, of course, that's something that then also is a decision that a company has to I take. I broaden it. I don't say leave. Yeah, 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 of course. I, I think mean, widen, widen the brief. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is definitely a good message for, for the researchers. Of course, the companies, they have another perspective often because, I mean, medical is, is hard to get, but once you have it, it's also so a, a good a, protection for... for, for there the is company. a uh, collateral standard that Jan uh, maybe uh, forgot to mention, which is actually medical equipment for home use. Okay, so that tells you how you extend your therapy for use, so as a medical device. Yeah, and I think this is something that is quite central in the in the in the rehab project. So we will have a number of presentations now this morning that uh, go into also mentioning this this part. Maybe one is there a question? Um, one, uh, I mean, one, one thing that was very interesting that you that that you we discussed. Only one, the yeah. only one. No, no, one that was really interesting to discuss with you yesterday. <laughs> not about the talk itself. Twenty years of my blood is. <laughs> 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 Uh, what I think uh, probably that you could also uh, give a, a few words was about this uh, this idea to make uh, this uh, student 
oh, gathering okay. together, okay. Uh, because that could be very relevant for Imperial College, but also for Tom and also uh, Let uh, me CGU. give you a yes, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. So the reason I'm, I'm in the um, UK, uh, when I got the invitation from Jerry was, uh, we as a university in, in India uh, wanted to start collaboration with UK because I did a lot of work in the UK. I have a lot of contacts in the UK and of course in Europe too. And my feeling is that uh, that now we have an ISO standard. We wanted to make now uh, uh, different types of uh, robots using student projects at different universities. But so we will not be asking the, the students to make a full robot, but to be making parts of the robot modules. Okay. Now the students will then interact with the other students across the consortium and uh, how they will make together. So the interoperability, and we will try to use the ISO standard for that. And I believe this allows us to demonstrate ISO modularity in action. And as we all universities, you know, we have to fund some of our student projects. You all have to, if you are doing student projects, you're, you're going to make some. And I'm sort of suggesting if you are interested, uh, and uh, three types of robots have already been suggested uh, to me, and we will. Uh, uh, one is a mobile servant robot. Okay, so this is a robot that will move around in a domestic environment navigate and, and uh, the second is a medical robot and the third is an exoskeleton. Okay, so these three type of projects we're going to run and uh, of course many details have to be sorted out in terms of when your students are active in project work, how we can link up with other universities in the same way and what we are talking about is then adding value to the students learning experience by getting them to interact with other students in other countries to make sure their component will, I should say their module, will mate both uh, physically and functionally. Okay, and uh, if you're interested, contact Thierry or, or me and we'll include you in the discussion. Okay, okay. thank you, Gurvinder. Was Is there a question no, from no you? Here for, uh, was the one over there? Yeah. Oh, Patrick. Uh, yes, thank you for a great talk. I have many questions. I want to focus down to one. There are many things you said that are very provocative. Uh, I like your idea about the more medical implications. So the interoperability aspect, I completely agree with you. I gave a talk a bit earlier in the week on interoperability in laboratory robotics. But one question I've got for you is about data. So we tend to think of robots as doing physical actions, and that's true, but the really interesting thing, really interesting thing is one you can collect the data from that. I uh, think of the Hoko net. Yes, Jan mentioned. Yes. Is there anything? What, what have you got in, in the standards about data, about open standards, about spare data? Coming back to the AIML and the, the broader ecosystem that probably isn't in the supply chain right now, produce that data? Yes, there's a section on safety and security. Uh, so that, uh, so if you are dealing with the uh, hand, if the exoskeleton is handling, of course, in the medical, you will be. Uh, uh, if you are handling some kind of uh, sensitive data, you have to put in appropriate measures to make sure that people can't uh, access that data. So the, uh, what uh, ISO standard doesn't uh, uh, tell you is how to do it, because that's up to you. You know, the, the, the ISO standard is what you have to do, and you, through your innovation, have to come up with the method. Okay, so it's not the how, it's a what you have to do. So you have to make sure that the data is secure, and can't be uh, accessed by unauthorized people. So it's easy to say. And but th there will be some examples uh, that will be given. Uh, so when the group feels that the, the group will never give you one way to do something, because that will you can't, for example, say use the coma method, because that will give coma the unfair advantage. Uh, so so we will uh, an ISO standard would never do that. Uh, and so what we may do is we may give a set of three system. We may say Hakoma or Honda or something, you know, three or four are good examples. It'll be something like that. And that's the best that a private company can expect. They have been an ISO standard. Okay. 
just like an IEEE sort of analysis. Well, IEEE, as you, you mentioned, it, 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 it's individuals are contributing. So you, you get up one vote. I saw, I see a country gets a vote. It's a different level of, uh, yeah? So it's a total different level. So, so the, the, the real sort of standards are ISO and IC. Really? No, no. Uh, we have no money from IP for the year. No, no, no it's, it's because I, I, I'm actually part of some I, I travel e, but it's normally a, a professor, he gives it to a master's student, and they do. So the, the, the level of the work is actually a different level. So you have to really understand that I, I really pay attention to these details. So you cannot expect the world to take the findings of a master's student, for example, it's just bonkers. You know, it's just bonkers. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, but when you have got the ISO groups working, they are serious, really serious, because their companies are sending them for five days, three days, and for five years to define the word robot. Okay, really. <laughs> Sorry. So on this point, I really have to disagree with you. I understand about the master's students. But one of the issues with the ISOs is that it's a different thing, which I think you described it. You have the suppliers going there. The problem with that, and we've seen this in the lab, is you need the users there, and you need the integrators. The suppliers are sure. at their point of view, so that is not always very helpful. Sure, sure, sure. So there are many industrial consortiums in parallel with ISO who also do some very, very bad Absolutely. Cartels are there. I totally know that. And robotics has a cartel. As I was telling you, this work was being stopped by this cartel. And uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But thank God for China on that time, on that time, on that day. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure it is virtually settled in this last year. There was a lot of shouting in the meeting in Germany and Korea. Oh, yes, it's very fun. It was a fever group. <laughs> yeah, it was not that. But it's, 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 it's published. Uh, so, what yeah, happened? Okay. So, so, uh, so, the negative votes that I mentioned, so there are about five different stages of voting that vote. They were constantly, in these countries, constantly voted negative for this. But the rest of the world voted. So, consensus is reached. It's okay. Germany is not happy. <laughs> ah, but, but we have three German experts who are contributing incredibly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, I understand. Yes, yes. There are no Chinese no people in Europe. <laughs> we should introduce some Chinese. So it's brings a 